tonight. She was saying earlier this is her first in-person talk on the book yet, so this is fantastic. We started talking with, with UPenn Press about, about, about doing this as a potential talk a, a good while ago, so this is wonderful. We're glad to have you tonight. We appreciate you keeping your masks on. The board is still trying to determine how to respond to the city's change in, in mask requirements. In the meantime, I'm trying out with the next, what we might require next, a big boot on your foot. I don't know if that's gonna catch on or not, so we might just stay with masks. Um, if we're, we're so happy to have you here. I'm wondering how many people it's your first time visiting the Athenaeum? A few people. Well, welcome. I hope you will come back again. If you have never been here before, we really are a very lively community at the Athenaeum, about 1,200 members, people who love reading, art, literature, in the environment, architecture, preservation, history, anything to do with Philadelphia. Um, we have our circulating library that members take advantage of. We have our special collections, which are open to the public um, for, for research. We also have our programs, both our evening programs, daytime programs, um, chamber music concerts, film series with Carrie Rickey, ongoing seminar courses. There is no shortage to what we have. And we invite all of you to come back again and experience more. Uh, and if you like what you experience to become a member and a part of this community. I just want to let you know that tomorrow night is our first Friday. It is already the first Friday in March. And we are um, celebrating that with a pop-up art exhibit with artist Charles Cushing. So I hope you will come between 5 and 7 tomorrow to enjoy that. Uh, and look on our events page for more events that are coming up. But right now, I want to get started on introducing our speaker. Tonight, we have Rebecca Bushnell, who most of you know. She is the School of Arts and Sciences Board of Advisors, Emerita Professor of English. I don't know why universities keep creating these horrendously long <laughs> titles, right? <laughs> that you could never get on your business card at the University of Pennsylvania. Rebecca Bushnell is the author of numerous books on subjects from Greek and Renaissance tragedy, early modern political thought, humanist pedagogy, early modern English gardening books, and time in drama, film, and video games. Her newest book is The Marvels of the World, an anthology of nature writing before 1700, which she hopes will be incorporated into college courses. She has served as Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at Penn and is a former president of the Shakespeare Association of America. Tonight, she's going to give us a talk and be available for Q&A afterwards. At the end of the talk, I'm going to come up and usher her down to the back where she will be signing books. Um, first day of spring is right around the corner, and what better way to celebrate that with someone you love and care about than a copy of a book about nature writings. So I hope you will all purchase a book for yourself, for friends at the end, and, and Rebecca will sign them for you. Um, but please don't come up here when she's done. Meet her back there if you want to say hello. At this time, I invite everybody to join me in welcoming Dr. Rebecca Bushnell to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. So great, I want to thank the Athenaeum for inviting me here to talk about the book today and also to thank all of you um, for coming. Um, today really what I want to do is to share with you some of my fascination with pre-modern nature writing. I think it's a fascination that it mixes admiration with horror, um, respect with admiration. But above all, I think it comes from a deep appreciation for the complexity of the human understanding about the non-human world from an earlier time. An earlier time, I think, when we felt so much more part of the world, and indeed, of course, we really still are part of that world, but sometimes we just tend to forget it. So to get you started, I'm thinking about just how fascinating this can be. I'm going to begin this talk with a little medieval medical advice, okay, how to handle the season of winter. Of course, a season which we hope right now we're about to exit, um, but you can always use some advice. So this passage comes um, from a medieval text called the Secreta Secretorum, or the Secret Book of Secrets, a little redundancy, um, which took the form of an imagined letter from Aristotle to Alexander the Great, preferring advice on topics like magic, astrology, statecraft, and also health. 
The earliest extant Arabic manuscript of this work dates to the 10th century, while the treatise's origins, in fact, are still unknown. Um, once it was translated into Latin in the 12th century, the Secretus spread across Europe, um, appearing in multiple vernaculars. It was hugely popular. Um, and this translation is from one that was done in 1528. So this passage comes from a, a section of the book um, of medical and dietary advice for every season of the year, and so for winter. So in this season, the nights be long and the days short. It is very cold. The wines be in the press and the leaves fall and the herbs lessens all their strength, or for the most part. The beast hideth them in the caves and the pits of hills, and the air and the weather are dark, and the earth is like an old, decrepit person. The great age is naked and nigh unto death. So winter is very cold and moist. And then it behooveth thee to use hot meats, such as chickens, hens, mutton, and other hot and fair flesh, to eat figs, nuts, and to drink green wines. And beware too much lax, that's laxatives, and bleeding, and a shoot company of women, for it will feeble thy stomach, and baths be good. And for the great cold, the natural heat that entereth into the body, and therefore the digestion is better in winter than in summer. So why, to me, is this so interesting? And what's so revealing about this passage? Now, what's behind a very, appears to be a very practical set of observations about diet and activity at a particular time of year is a deep and complicated way of thinking about bodies and our relationship between our bodies and the world around us. Now, you surely will have noticed in this passage the vocabulary of cold versus hot and wet versus dry when it comes to the weather the nature of the human body or the qualities of food. So where does this come from? Well, natural philosophy in this period was informed by the idea that everything on earth and in the heavens was composed of the elements of earth, air, fire, and water. So as you can see here in this 14th century manuscript illustration of the levels of those uh, elements. So in terms, the elements were thought to be tempered by what were then called the qualities of hot, cold, wet, and dry. So each element could be attributed to two qualities at any given time. So for example, for the Arabic um, physician and philosopher Avicenna, air is a simple substance whose position in nature is above the sphere of water and beneath that of fire, as you can see here. The nature, it is hot and moist. But of course, while that's so, what we do learn is quickly is that all the elements are constantly in flux. Um, and intention, therefore air at some points could be you know, hot and dry. And so in this sense, it was understood that the natural world itself was inherently unstable. So everything living thing, in turn human or non-human, had qualities also associated with elements. So for example, in this, uh, for an herbalist like William Turner um, from the early modern period, chamomile is hot and dry in the first degree. So this is what Turner says about chamomile. Chamomile is hot and dry in the first degree, and chamomile in subtleness is like the rose, but in heat it draweth more near the quality of oil, which is very agreeing to the nature of man and temperate. Therefore it is good against weariness, it assuageth ache, and unbindeth, and looseneth that it is stretched out, it softeneth that that is but measurably hard, and setting it abroad that was narrowly thrust together. It driveth away and dissolveth agues, or fevers, which come not what with the inflammation of any inward part, and especially such as come from choleric humors and the thickness of the skin. And this is just the beginning of a long list of cures associated with the chamomile, mostly which are focused on gastrointestinal and genitourinary disorders, which is why, of course, we still take chamomile today, often after a meal, you know, to settle our stomachs. But elements and qualities like this, you can see, interact with each other in the human body. So chamomile itself might be understood to be hot and dry, but not too hot. And in that sense, it was agreeable to the nature of man um, and good against weariness, aches, and fevers. But humans and animals, in turn, elements and qualities were understood to shake individual, shape individual temperaments or complexions. They make us who we are. So Gervais Markham, one of my favorite people from this period who was a popular early modern English writer on raising and treating horses, prefaces his recommendations for treating horses by considering the compositions of a horse's body, which was made up like the human body 
of several natural, seven natural things, elements, temperaments, humors, members, powers or virtues, actions or operations, and spirits. So this is what he says about a horse. So he says, thus the horse is known to be hot and moist by his lightness, swiftness, valiantness, and long life, and also to be of a temperate nature in that he is easily tamed, docile, obedient, and familiar with the man. And so as long as either horse or any other thing continueth in the mediocrity and excellency of his proper temperament, as long as we may truly judge of him of good temper and disposition, but if there be any overflow of qualities and excess in his humors, as either heat, coldness, moistness, or dryness, then we say he's either a hot choleric horse, well, a cold, dull horse, a dry, mischievous horse, or a moist, cowardly horse, according to the overflow of that quality that reigneth in him. So Markham just starts with earth, air, you know, water and fire to characterize the horse's temperament as naturally hot and dry, but then he acknowledges when they get out of balance, the qualities can change, thus affecting both temperament and character. He then goes on later in this passage uh, to note how the horse's temperature and thus temperament are also subject to age and to climate. So a young horse, he says, is hot and moist, but an old one is cold and dry. And horses that come from the south of the globe are naturally hot. So in that sense, um, uh, climate also has an effect on the, you know, on the constitution of an animal. So in fact, the theory of the elements and qualities underlies ideas about how climate and weather can affect both the body and the character of people and animals. So dating from antiquity, the Hippocratic Treatise on Airs, Waters, and Places launched the very influential and elaborate argument that environment shapes the health and personality of an individual or a community. This is just one example from the Hippocratic um, treatises about uh, an area, in this case a city, that is exposed to hot winds. These are between the wintry rising and the wintry setting of the sun, and to which there are peculiar, but which is sheltered from the north winds. In such a city, the waters will be plenteous and saltish. And as they run from an elevated source, they are necessarily hot in summer and cold in winter. The heads of the inhabitants are of a humid and piteous constitutions, and their belly is subject to frequent disorders, owing to the phlegm running down from the head. The forms of their bodies, for the most part, are rather flabby. They do not eat or drink much, and drinking wine in particular, and more especially if carried to intoxication, is oppressive to them. So what's interesting here, I mean, this is, a, you know, and there are many, many examples in the Hippocratic treatises of how um, uh, where you live influences what your body is like, but you can see here on um, the schema for winter, the element of water, the qualities are, um, Cold and moist, oh wait, I've missed something here. Um, so here you can see the idea here that the bodies of the inhabitants resemble the environment that they inhabit. So in this case, one hot in summer and cold in winter, but where the waters run down from the hills or mountains and therefore with the bodies of the people, um, they have phlegm that runs from the head down to the belly and this makes them flabby and sickly. So such thinking had a very influential afterlife um, in the, up to the early modern period where writers often came up with explanations to justify what they saw as the relative qualities of different races and ethnicities where climate then became inscribed in the body and in human character. So finally, the, first the Hippocratic writers and, and later the Greek physician Galen adapted the theories of elements and qualities for medical practices that dominated the field throughout antiquity. In turn, in the Middle Ages, Islamic scholars disseminated these Galenic and Hippocratic ideas which circulated around Europe for centuries to come. So the conditions, constellation of elemental mixtures and qualities, physicians added the concept that four humors govern all animals' physical health and personality. So, and many of you have probably heard of this, and this theory, the state of a person's body and mind depend on the balance of those humors, or which are kind of fluids imagined to circulate throughout your system. And these would include blood, phlegm, red or yellow bile, otherwise called collar, and black bile, 
otherwise called melancholer, as in melancholia. And so each humor would express a kind of uh, qualities in a human character as well. So if you had too much black bile in you, guess what? You were melancholic. Too much, too much blood, you're sanguine, etc. Too much phlegm, you're phlegmatic. So again, you can see here in this scheme of hair, um, the element for winter, the element is water, the qualities are cold and moist, and the humor is phlegm, um, which slows us down when we become cold and wet and we become phlegmatic. So humoral medicine relied, of course, on diet and food to counteract the overbalance of humoral qualities of, so for example, you would go back to the passage from Turner on chamomile, um, who does recommend chamomile against what he calls choleric or choleric humors or irritability. So chamomile itself may be hot and dry, but apparently its qualities were considered to be mild enough that they could counteract the effects of choler. All right, so that was a long detour to go back here. Okay. So let's go back to the advice from the Secretus Secretorum. So here, for example, so how can you protect yourself from the climatic effects of winter in which the earth itself is like a cold, aged, and decrepit body? Well, the first thing you need to do is eat hot foods. Now, by hot foods here, we don't mean hot by temperature soups and stews. We mean things that were understood to have qualities, which are here as identified as chicken and mutton, figs and green wine. You can also see here the advice not to use laxatives, not to subject yourself to being bled, and not to have sex uh, with women. These are all okay to do in the springtime, by the way, so you can look forward um, in a few months uh, to do this. Apparently, actually, according to the Secretus Secretorium, it's only one time of year that it's okay to have sex, and that is in the spring, so just word to the wise. So why not, you know, why not? Um, well, you know, as you think, what's the thinking behind the idea that you shouldn't be doing these things in winter? Um, my sense is, is because all of those things would open up your body and release fluids um, out of here. I think the concept here is to keep the heat inside you, to keep the heat in your belly um, and in your body, um, to protect yourself against the cold weather. Um, it is interesting, by the way, that it's okay to take a bath now, but not in the summer. So, word to the wise, who knew? So my point here, and drawing your attention to the theory of the elements, to Galenic medicine, or thinking about humors, is it's not to say that they're medically or scientifically true, and obviously they're not. But my point here is in returning to natural philosophy and medical theory from this period, it reminds us to think about the ways in which our bodies and our health are so deeply intertwined with the world around us that we share a materiality with plants and animals and with the earth itself. I would, however, remind us all here also that medicine today has indeed returned to exploring more about how diet and climate affect our health, and particularly in the centrality of the gut to the well-being of our whole body. So again, think about it. So it's this kind of quirky text, and many, many others like it, that led me to this project, The Marvels of the World, which was assembling an anthology of pre-modern nature writing, you know, covering from about the, you know, from the early classical period up to 1700. My interest in this subject actually dates back to the mid-1990s when I wrote a book on humanist teaching, where I explored the ways in which uh, humanist teaching was compared with gardening at the time. And this led in due course, in fact, to my writing a book on early modern English gardening. Um, which was called Green Desire, Imagining Early Modern English Gardens. And this book, which was probably the favorite one that I ever wrote, um, it really focuses on the mostly practical, while sometimes wildly impractical, um, discourse of horticultural from this period, um, which I found both you know, profoundly imaginative and aspirational. So all my reading and teaching since then has actually spurred me to share what I have learned about pre-modern nature writing in the West, reaching all the way back to the classical period. I'm committed to countering a pre prevalent narrative in the West that the concept of nature really wasn't invented until modern times, or at least not in the way that we would recognize it. Usually the story of environmentalism 
begins with a brutal anthropomorphism dominating early Western thinking about nature for centuries, which evolves only in the early 19th century with Romanticism. And when most people think about nature writing today, honestly, they really usually cannot reach back further than Thoreau or Wordsworth. So in undertaking this project, I also wanted to broaden the idea of what constitutes nature writing, extending it beyond the canonical, philosophical, or literary sources to works like that passage from the Secreta Secretorum, for example, to how-to manuals and recipe collections, which offer insight into people's everyday involvement with the stuff of the natural world. Marvels of the World falls into seven parts, you know, really embracing this great variety of text, including different ways of thinking about the natural world from natural philosophy and science, engaging with plants and animals, gardening and gardens, experiencing weather and climate, the representations of people inhabiting the natural world, and finally, encounters with nature outside Europe. And it traces several lines of thinking in these seven areas, really starting from two points, the Hebrew Bible's account of creation and Aristotle's foundational natural philosophy. My most important point is that all of the resulting pre-modern models for constructing the natural world would allow that, even though humans are meant to control and exploit the environment they inhabit, they, inhabit, they will always intimately touch it and be open to it. These models include the structure of the ladder of nature, a network of correspondences, and antipathies and sympathies that connect all living things, and the understanding, as I've already suggested, that all matter in the world is really composed of the elements of earth, fire, air, and water, and the accompanying qualities and humors. So the concept of the ladder of nature, or what's also been called the great chain of being, dominates many accounts of the early modern natural world that date back to Aristotle, who, at, why, by the way, while acknowledging the difficulty of making distinctions, he described a hierarchy of lifeless and living things. Then, in turn, of course, Christian theology adapted this notion to mesh with the Bible's teaching that man is superior to all creation, made in God's image, and uniquely capable of reason. So this vision grows to constitute a divine, li oops, excuse me, did not mean to do that. Where's the back? There we go. There we go. Um, this vision grows to constitute a divinely ordained natural order in forming human society. However, complicating this assistance on hierarchy was the tendency to see everything in the natural world mirrored in the non, you know, in the human world. A human being, after all, was understood to be the microcosm of all creation. So more than symbolic, I think this idea was rooted in a belief in the profound connectedness of the natural and human worlds, which was a kind of network of innumerable linkages called correspondences and sympathies. So in this sense, in this sense, the world was not understood as a kind of ladder of nature, but nature was more understood as a book, or what Keith Thomas called a cryptogram full of hidden meanings for man awaiting decipherment. So I think the ladder of nature also teetered when decomposed into those elements of earth, air, fire, and water, tempered by the qualities of hot, cold, wet, and dry. So if I've already outlined every living thing, human or non-human, had qualities associated with those elements. And in human and animals, those qualities were understood to shape their individual temperaments or complexions. As we've seen to this constellation of the elemental mixtures or qualities, physicians added the concept that those four humors govern all animals' physical health and personalities. And these constantly had to be attended to, mostly through the use of diet and physic, bleeding and purging, just to keep ourselves and our bodies in balance. So thus, not only was the ladder of nature itself really unstable because of the similarity between ourselves and everything else on Earth, but our own bodies and characters were imagined to be essentially unstable and volatile and enmeshed in the world that we inhabit. Now, in the rest of my talk today, I'm going to focus on just two more examples. Two texts from the anthology, one about a plant and another about an animal. As a way of illustrating 
the complexity and often surprising qualities of this writing as I encountered it when I pursued this anthology. It was actually wickedly hard to choose two examples out of this, but I did come up with two. One on the power of the plant aconite, or wolfsbane, and the other on the weirdness of cats and our relationship to them. I have three, so I know all about this. So what you'll find overall in the writing about plants and animals is these non-human creatures certainly matter for their relevance to human life. Their role, of course, is to feed, to carry, to cure, or please us. Because plants and animals thus assure human survival, they do touch every part of daily life, and people then knew that they must care for them in turn, and they had to observe them closely. While subjecting them to human needs, writers often attributed to plants and animals power over us, not only because we depend on them, but also because in a world of sympathies and antipathies concerning all living things, they also have the agency to affect human bodies. And further, in the network of elaborate analogies drawn between human and non-human natures, other living things can symbolize our lives. And in this sense, always we see they are more like us than they are different. So my first example is a passage on the power of plants from Guillaume de Bartas, The Sept Mains aux Créations du Monde, which is a magnificent epic poem describing the seven days of creation as translated here by Josué Sylvester as Divine Weeks and Works from 1605. So in his section on the third day of creation, du Bartas, as translated by Sylvester, describes the creation of the vegetal world. And there he celebrates the extraordinary power of plants that go beyond their effects on humanity. And this is what he says generally about plants. He says, nor powerful herbs do we only find your virtues working and fail humankind, but you can force the fiercest animals, the fellest fiends, the firmest minerals, yea, fairest planets, if antiquity have not belied the hags of Thessaly. Now, to modernize this pay unto plants may seem wildly hyperbolic or fanciful that the force and influence of plants extends not just to animals, but to demons, stones, and to the heavens themselves. But the concept is embedded in a very old idea that plants have what we call virtues, as we see in the second line of this passage, your virtues working in frail humankind. So what's a virtue when it comes to plants? Well, in the very long OED entry on virtue, you will find a definition of it as a power inherent in a thing, a capacity for producing a certain effect, an act of property or principle, a faculty. But when it comes to connecting virtue to plants, the OED tones it down a bit. It says, with reference to a plant, liquid or other substance, power to affect the body in a beneficial manner, strengthening, sustaining, or healing power. But the recurring words and definitions of virtue outside of its moral valence are inherent in power. Virtue thus frames power and agency through a plant's ability to access and influence the world, human or otherwise. So let's look at one example cited by Du Bartas on the power of aconite, or wolfsbane, which is understood now to be a powerful neurotoxin. Um, understood then to be a, a remedy against the venom of a snake bite. It's a beautiful plant. Don't eat it, OK? So when it comes to aconite, Du Bartas swells the theme to recognize, represent aconite as a noble combatant against the equally valiant snake venom, anthropomorphizing the plant in a way that embraces the non-botanical meanings of virtue. This is what he says about aconite. He says, what rank or poison what more deadly bane than aconite can there be touched or tame? And yet his juice, but cures the burning bite of stinging serpents if applied to it. Oh, valiant venom, oh, courageous plant, disdainful poison, noble combatant, that scorneth aid and loves alone to fight, that none partake the glory of his might. So here I would point your attention to the language of war and violence, which is celebrated here as a form of power. Aconite is courageous and noble at the same time it is deadly and rank in its battle against the venom of a snake bite. The passive human body here becomes actually just the field of battle between the warring substances of plant and animal. So my point here is 
While we still may be seeing plants from the point of view of their uses for human beings, this passage points to the principle underlying plant thinking in the pre-modern West, that plants are powerful and consuming or touching them or even smelling them can change you. Again, think back actually to that passage from the Secreta about the plants um, and the food that you eat. This passage also suggests that not only how people might be like plants, but how plants might be like people, people with agency, whoever poetically imagined. So let me turn by my second example, which is writing about cats. Okay, honestly, I never pass up an opportunity to talk about cats. Um, so thinking about animals then, I think was probably even more complicated than thinking about plants, even though people saw analogies between our lives and those of plants, animals are even more like us after all. We are animals. And many entries in this anthology are devoted to exploring the ways in which there are confusions of categories between plants, between humans and animals, whether we're animals are allegorized to teach morality as in animal fables or the medieval bestiaries, or in the medical treatises where animals are seen to have the same humoral constitutions as people. Even before Descartes, one might find that rigid separation between human and non-human animals on the basis of cognition. The so-called ladder of nature was even more slippery than you might think. But I've chosen here to talk about Edward Topsell's extensive description of cats in his history of four-footed beasts. Now, for several reasons, because I, I like it, because it nicely demonstrates the mixture of received wisdom and direct observation in natural history and pre-modernity, which is based on intimacy mixed with book learning. But it also exemplifies the uneasiness generated by an intimate relationship between a human and an animal, and that odd mixture of admiration, distrust, and cruelty that always one finds in early accounts of domestic species. So Edward Topsell was a Cambridge-educated English clergyman who, while writing many religious and tracts and sermons, he published in 1605 the amply illustrated, and that's a long title and I'm going to read it out, The History of Four-Footed Beasts Describing the True and Lively Figure of Every Beast with a Discourse of Their Several Names, Conditions, Kinds, Virtues, Both Natural and Medicinal, Countries of Their Breed, Their Love and Hate to Mankind, and the Wonderful Work of God in Their Creations, Preservation, and Destruction. And in this, he was actually borrowing a great deal from the Swiss divine Conrad Gensler's uh, monumental Historia Animalium, uh, a book that was published earlier in the 16th century. So Topsell's books certainly owed a whole lot less to close natural observation and functioned more to collect stories and myths about beasts. But at the same time, he wrote often to share his own thoughts and observations when he did know an animal directly, as apparently he did in the case of the cat. So the entrance on the cat exemplifies to me this mixture of received wisdom and personal experience. And there Topsell reveals his ambivalence about this domestic animal that he saw at once too close and too dangerous to humankind, as he called it, both good and evil. So in his entry in the cat, he goes into a great detail about feline behavior. He notes the qualities of the cat's eyes, tongue, teeth, whiskers, nails, and the modes by which the cat hunts hides her own dung, and returns to her place of breeding. In this passage, however, Topps really lets go on his observation, observations about how cats respond to people and how they play. I tried to shorten this passage, and it was impossible to actually find a place to stop. I'm going to read it out. <coughs> so it's needless to spend any time about her loving nature to man, how she flattereth by rubbing her skin against one's legs, how she whirleth with her voice, having as many tunes as turns, for she hath one voice to beg and complain, another to testify her delight and pleasure, another among her own kind by flattering, by hissing, by puffing, by spitting, insomuch as some have thought they have a peculiar intelligible language among themselves. Therefore has she beggeth, playeth, leapeth, looketh, catcheth, tosses with her hood, rises up to strings held over her head, sometimes creeping, sometimes lying on her back, playing with one foot, sometimes on the belly, snatching, now with mouth and anon with foot, apprehending readily anything save the hand of man with such divers, such, such, divers, such gestural actions. 
it is needless to stand upon. So you can see how I found it hard to know where to stop. <laughs> Um, what's extraordinary about this passage to me is Topsil's getting so carried away with trying to detail all of these behaviors that he has observed. It's like he cannot stop with the verbs describing her playfulness, both with other cats, um, uh, the ways in which they seem to have their own language, and also with humans. The description of the cat play actually reminds me of Montaigne's famous statement on the Apology for Raymond Sabon, where he said, when I am playing with my cat, who knows whether she have more sport in dallying with me than I have in gaming with her. We entertain one another with mutual apish tricks. Who indeed, in Topsil's passage, is playing with whom? But if Topsil himself, it seems as if Topsil himself recognized that he was getting carried away by his amazement at the variety and pleasures of cat love and play. Because in the following passage, he pulls back, in fact, to condemn people who love their cats too much. And indeed, he says, neglect their own health and friends. As he sternly put it, Eth's beast has been familiarly nourished of many, so have they paid dear for their love. Being requited with loss of their health and sometimes their life for their friendship and worthily because they have which love any beasts in high measures, how so much less charity unto man. In other words, they love their cats too much and they neglect other people. So fair warning, cat lovers. The rest of the entry on the cat actually turns against the animal as being dangerous to humans. He avers that it is most certain that the breath and savor of cats consumes the radical humor and destroys the lungs. And therefore, those, listen to this, everybody, those who keep their cats with them in their beds have the air corrupted and fall into fevers hectic and consumption. So after the discussion of the dangers of eating cats, um, because they eat rats who've been poisoned, he goes on to grouse as follows. This must need be an unclean and impure beast that liveth only upon vermin and by ravening. For it is commonly said, really, of a man who when he sneatheth, he has eaten with cats. Likewise, the familiars of witches do most ordinarily appear in the shape of cats, which is an argument that this beast is dangerous in soul and body. It is said that if bread be made wherein the jong of cats is mixed, it will drive away rats and mice. But we conclude the story of this beast with the medicinal observations and tarry no longer in the breadth of such a creature compounded of good and evil. It is reported that the flesh of cats, salted and sweetened, hath power in it to draw winds from the body and being warm to cure the hemorrhoids and pains in the reins and back. Um, he actually uh, goes on a little bit after this uh, to talk about um, how uh, you can burn the head of a black cat and up into powder and blow it into the eyes of a, um, a disease and it will cure a diseased eye. So the, the collocation of ideas in this passage is much more of what you would expect of a text drawing about received wisdom about cats. The familiars of witches uh, appear as cats. There is this idea that when someone sneezes, they have eaten with cats. I'm not sure where this idea comes from. Um, if anybody can help me, I would appreciate it. Um, and then, of course, it moves on to the notion of uh, using cat flesh for medical cures. Um, and again, the one after this is the using of the, the burned head of a black cat to cure a diseased eye. So overall, then, this passage from Topsail and Cats, of which I've shared only a bit, demonstrates some of the complexity that is found in early modern writing about animals. So on the one hand, ideas about animals are filtered through tradition, folklore, and religion with their century, centuries-old ideas and preconceptions about animals. Um, but on the other hand, it was acknowledged that people lived in close codependency um, with domesticated animals, and they came to know them intimately and often those in ways that really contradicted those received ideas about animals. But for all that, of course, as you can see here, there was little sentimentality in a culture in which animals could routinely be slaughtered for food or medicine. And again, of course, there's much to be said. I'm happy to share uh, others' examples or ideas from the books. I can talk about dogs if you want. Um, but I want to make sure that I leave plenty of time for discussion. We can also return in the end to any of these passages. So let me just end with a few concluding thoughts. So 
In my remarks today, although in the case of Du Bartas, I was looking at a literary text, I was invoking pre-modern approaches and ideas that one might say would impinge on science or natural history. So for your idea that plants have virtues or powers, or the exact description of the behavior and uses of an animal. And of course, modern science dismisses what of the writers you have read, you know, we've discovered here today, have written as fantasy or pseudoscience, and of course, a lot of it is. However, I do still believe there's much to be learned from a time much more engaged with the environment than people are in the developed world today. Even in their most relentless anthropomorphism, many of these approaches to the natural world emphasize reciprocity and the value of knowledge gained from experience and observation. Not so much the kind of knowledge that is gained from the rigors of the scientific method, but rather that earned from everyday experience driven by necessity. Premodern nature writing also asks us to remember our physical and cultural vulnerability to natural forces beyond our control, that everything that happens in the non-human world touches us in some way whether on the small scale in our encounter with a plant or an animal, or in more broadly in the catastrophe of the storm. And as we saw in the passage from the Secreta Secretorum, at the heart of now dismissed theories of medicine lies the important truth. The human bodies are influenced by what they consume, by extreme heat and cold, and the qualities of air and water. So one comes away from reading these texts with a sense of the extraordinary openness of pre-modern thinking about the engagement of human beings with an environment that has such power to shape us even as we may seek to control and exploit us. So that's it, and I'm happy um, to take questions or come back to other examples. Yes. Right. Well, it should. That's, that's a really excellent point. I think it was also um, understood at another point to be, you know, to be bad for wolves as well. I mean, the the example that I gave about, you know, aconite was just simply one of the applications of of aconite. But yes, I mean, its name as wolfsbane. Um, its enmity to, to wolves is embedded in its, in its name. I mean, it's so interesting in, in so many of these books you can just go on to say, you know, of what are the natural um, enmities between different kinds of plants and different kinds of animals and what sort of animal skins will keep away snakes. You know, if you just have them, you know, in, you know overnight, if you have a blanket of a tear skin, you know, that will keep that the snakes. I mean, there's just all these elaborate structures of what you would understand as the natural antipathies of, of between animals and, and also plants in this world. But yes, you're absolutely right. It was also bad for wolves. <laughs> yes. Well, I think so. Superstition is interesting. I mean, the whole concept, I mean, a lot of what's in this writing is superstition, if you want to call what it is a superstition. I mean, that, you know, two thirds of it is, you know, utter fantasy. Um, uh, and it, you know, and extends, you know, way on up into, um, you know, into the, into the writings of certainly up until 1700. One of my favorite examples, and this actually began when I started to read the gardening books from, the English gardening books from the 16th, you know, in the 17th century. And I would just come over, you know, time and time again over gardening and voice, like, if you want to keep hail from damaging your garden, plant a toad, you know, in the, in, in the eastern corner. Um, and you can call that superstition, which was in, you know, folk practice and folk understanding. And so a lot of the writers are actually going to wise women, you know, people in the country, things that they heard, things they read in books, um, 
and building them into their writings, which then gave them a kind of greater authority. And, and the people who wrote these books, you know, about planting the toad in the corner of your garden will say, think proved, made, made it happen, okay, who wanted to vouch for um, the authority and truth of what it was that they said. So there's, it's hard to disentangle in the writing of this period what you might want to call the work of the literate and the un illiterate because they're all kind of tangled up. They're tangled up together. Yeah. Um, I'm about to say, I know. Um, <laughs> They're very close together, and it's almost as if, when, you know, if I'm, and you can notice, because I'm trained as a professor of English literature, right? So I tend to read these books like a professor of English literature and do exactly what is described here to say, look at the difference between the language and the rhetoric of that passage when he seems to be so carried away with this, his delight. with actually a sense of, of innocence and connection in this case, 
Example of one that I was going to um, that I was going to bring up. Um, well, there's an example in Shakespeare. I don't have written here right now. Um, when the friar in Romeo and Juliet is collecting plants, um, there's a scene in which I think it's in Act Two, Scene One, and the friar is, is collecting plants before Romeo comes in and he talks about the plants and their and their virtues that he's collecting. And he, and he pulls out one plant, which unfortunately doesn't say what it is. Only plants could be understood to be artificial. In fact, their agency can be doubled and can be at once, you know, good and evil, um, or deadly and beneficial, depending on you know how much heat it is. You know, that's, that's why I, so I can why I put foxglove up here for my uh, for digitalis on my um, on my example for plant virtues because foxglove is example. So if you want to talk about how plants can actually be as but they can certainly be as evil as they are good, um, depending on their use of the Yeah, back there. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, just to keep myself sane, you know, I focus this um, volume on literature on the West, you know, but um, except for the final chapter, which is on, as I, as I say, the, you know, understanding of, of what I call outlandish nature, which is a, an early modern term. That the, the word outlandish, as we now use, used to mean that literally not from this land, you know, other, fine or otherwise. And so, um, uh, and 
I have a passage in there from the travels of John Mandeville from the medieval uh, travels of John Mandeville and talking about his encounters with the natural world um, in you know, many different places, you know, extending up to passages from the Royal Society and descriptions of things in Java. Um, so yes, absolutely, there are, there is so much information you know coming on and you know early on I mean Pliny you know writing in the Roman period is you know he's also looking globally at different kinds of things from the natural world and some of it ultimately is still imagined or imaginary but it all yes so you can see there this is you know from Canox you know it's got lions in there. Um, what do you know about? Well, probably some things about lions, but um, but you have this, you know, blending of the of the fantastic other world in with the known domestic world, and, and very, very good. Yeah. You got a question? Yeah. Yeah. a couple passages in this book are taken from a, a whole book uh, from the period on English dogs. Um, uh, John Key's book is called Of English Dogs, um, in which he goes on, in this case, at great length, talking about the characteristics of each of the breeds of dogs. So, so for example, um, one of the, well, he talks about the setters, which he's very, you know, he loves, but he comes down very hard on the Maltese, because he said it's the ladies' lap dog. And the ladies get away with eating it with their Maltese, with their Maltese dogs, and it's highly disapproved of so, like women who have this kind of almost erotic relationship. So, so again, it, it, it's a lot. 
lot of it will be devoted to, or you know, Markham, Gervais Markham, who was actually at one point the Stasius Company, people who control <coughs> publication um, uh, in, in London, and just to do a tiny hole, you had to stop publishing books that part. That's just enough to say. <laughs> do you say we have time for one more? One more question? Time for one more question? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. in the Apology for Raymond Savon, where he goes on at some length in talking about animals having their own language, and our problem is just we can't understand it, but it doesn't mean that it isn't a language. You know, we just don't know it. So I would direct you to that passage, which is really, which is really amazing, um, in which Montaigne is looking at the way that the world looks from another point of view through animal point of view. So we good? I okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Round of applause. Very good. We'd like you to come back to say hello to her and uh, buy a copy or two of her book. You brought one with you. Get fine. And, um, great. Thank you, and thank you so much. Those were great questions and comments. Thanks. Thanks so much. Okay, and someone can eject my yes. uh, my dingus. All right. Very good.